I've made a lot of progress on my MMO project, but I haven't done a good job keeping up with the video series about it. It's been feeding into this perpetual cycle where I forget what I did, which makes me avoid creating a video about it, which makes me do more development, which makes me forget more of what I've done. Not a good look. Presenting what I did last year by unit of time. Let me apologize in advance though. In some cases, I didn't do a good job tracking clips. So to fill in those gaps, I'll use this nice audio waveform overlay. Also, if there's something you want more info about, let me know in the comments and I'll try to do a more in-depth follow-up about it. In the future, I'll do a better job tracking update clips, which will hopefully make my videos easier to follow and easier to create. With that intro out of the way, let's travel back in time to the end of 2021. At the time, I had just finished getting some basic networking done. The player could move around on the island, but their movement was very jittery. So I added some smoothing which made everything jitterless, but also made the player feel a bit too floaty. Even though the player movement wasn't perfect, I decided to move on because I really wanted to get the game launched so that other people could try it. My idea was to host the game on a web page so that someone could easily log in through their browser and skip all the friction of having to download and install a full game. This also made patching easy because players will always get the newest version of the game when they refresh the page. Unfortunately, the rendering library that I started the project with didn't support web builds, so I did what any normal person would do, I wrote my own. I ended up calling my rendering library Glitch. At a high level, the architecture is pretty simple. Glitch talks to two wrapper packages, one for GLFW and one for OpenGL. When compiling for desktop, the GLFW and OpenGL wrapper packages will use the regular C versions of GLFW and OpenGL. However, when compiling for browsers, we build a WebAssembly binary which uses JavaScript calls to interact with a WebGL canvas instead. Luckily for me, someone had already written most of the GLFW and OpenGL wrapper APIs, so I was able to fork and customize that to suit my needs. Eventually I'll make a video about how Glitch works internally, but right now I'm still finalizing the APIs, so it's a bit of a work in progress. After I migrated to Glitch, all I had to do was replace our TCP socket with a web socket and we had the game playing from a browser. Pretty cool. Go released generics in version 1.18, so I figured it would be a good time to rewrite my ECS library. This took a good amount of effort, so I already made a video where I talk about how I optimized that. Next I wanted to add animations. This wasn't too hard, animations are just a list of sprites that we cycle through based on a timer. Inside each animation frame, I store the duration and the sprite that needs to get drawn. Then in the main animation object, I just have an update loop which lets you step through each frame. Next up, hats. After all, what's an MMO without any hats? To make it a bit more complex, I made a full equipment mounting system for my sprites. Here's how it works. In a sprite, I make a special layer called mount, where I draw a single pixel of a single color. This pixel position represents where something would get mounted to. For example, the red pixel here indicates that this is where hats should get mounted for every frame of the animation. On each hat, I place a black pixel to specify the origin point of the hat. That way, when I draw the hat, I just align its black pixel to the character's red pixel, and voila. When I export my sprites from a sprite, I draw them twice, once for the mount layer and once for the sprite layer. Then with the mount layer image, I can simply loop through the pixels and collect the location of each color. This strategy has ended up working pretty well and I haven't had to change it much. It also made it easier to make any of my characters fashionable. Now that we have movement and hats, the two most important components for an MMO, all I needed to do before launch was fix bugs, race conditions, and a few other to-dos that I had left scattered throughout the project. After that, I deployed the game on Google Cloud. It seemed familiar, and they also have a free tier providing 0.6 virtualized CPU cores. It turns out that when a lot of people logged in, my CPU would burst above the 0.6 threshold, costing me about a dollar a month. So, not terrible. To deploy, I just copied the binaries to the server and ran them in a Tmux terminal. This means if the game crashed, it wouldn't restart, but luckily that didn't happen very often. Later on, I spent a couple weeks writing another program which would launch, monitor, and restart my processes if needed. This was probably a waste of time, but on the positive side, I did learn a lot about how processes work in Linux. I think in the future I'll probably use something like Docker. During initial testing, me and some viewers in my stream were able to scale up to about 20 concurrent players before the game started to lag. We did this by opening a bunch of tabs, which is probably not the best way to do service load testing, but I'm going to count it as valid. There was, of course, some bugs. The first major bug was that switching tabs breaks the game. I later learned that the browser was backgrounding the game process, causing the physics loop and the WebSocket connection to stall. I fixed this by adding a threshold rule, where if the physics simulation falls too far behind, it just resets instead of trying to catch up. It was fun to have everyone finally log in and walk around, but most people were still talking in Discord. So I got to work adding some in-game chat. This was pretty easy to add on now that our networking was pretty stable. I made a basic text input box for the player to type in, then when they hit enter I would send the message to the server to be broadcasted to everyone. When each player received the message, the game would render some text above the player who sent it, kind of like RuneScape. Now that the chat was, uh, that's just great. Anyways, the next major bug was that you could walk off the map causing you to go somewhere. Originally, my collision resolution operated on both axes at the same time. First it detects that the player was on a tile they shouldn't be. Then it tries to calculate the vector that they need to move in to get back to the nearest valid tile. This makes the math somewhat difficult and causes there to be a lot of situations to handle. I ended up rewriting it to be a bit simpler. If we handle each axis independently, we can do the following. First, we save the original position of the player. 
Then we calculate the vector that they want to move in. First, we move them in the x direction, and if they collide, we move them back the same amount. Then we just repeat that for the y direction. There was still a lot of rubber banding for people who had international connections. To help with debugging, I added a debug mode, which would render the most recent positions and a graph showing the ping on each packet. Then I used a Linux tool called Traffic Control to simulate international networking conditions with some ping and packet loss. With the additional packet loss, I was seeing really high ping and a ton of jitter. I surmised that the drop packets were causing TCP to do a lot of resends, which was blocking some of the newer update packets. Because TCP guarantees packet delivery, some packets require multiple round trips to send and acknowledge the receipt of the packet. And because I was using WebSockets in the browser, my hands were tied to TCP. Luckily, there's a browser standard called WebRTC, which was created to support streaming audio and video in peer-to-peer -peer web conferencing calls. It allows for unreliable UDP-based messaging channels, which is exactly what we need. I decided to bite the bullet and port everything over to WebRTC, but because WebRTC is peer-based, it's a lot more complicated than your average socket. Usually, WebRTC requires a middleware STUN server, which stands for Session Traversal Utilities for NAT. The STUN server bypasses the NAT restrictions caused by both computers hiding behind home routers. Luckily for us, the game server has a public IP address and no NAT layer in front of it. This means we don't need a STUN server, but we do need what's called a signal channel to let the two computers negotiate the connection. I chose to use a WebSocket as the signal channel, but according to the docs, emails, postcards, and carrier pigeons are a few alternatives. Switching to WebRTC fixed our original problem of drop packets causing more lag. But now that we have WebRTC, drop packets will never be resent, which means they will never make it to their destination. Knowing this gives us more responsibility in how we send things, but it also lets us do a few neat tricks. For example, because we know we'll eventually drop a few packets, we can duplicate our sends and effectively trade some bandwidth for less dropped packets. For now I chose just to duplicate the input packets that the player sends to the server, mostly helping each client more effectively predict its own player's position. In that same vein, let's talk about client prediction. Our goal with client prediction is to make the player feel like their game is running on the same tick as the server. Because the server is some distance from the client, we will have to guess at a few things. First things first, let's guess what tick number the server is currently on. It's kind of hard to think about, so I'm going to use these diagrams to help explain my solution. First, the client and server both run a physics simulation at the same frequency called the fixed time step. Along with that, the client and server maintain separate tick counters which increment every time a physics tick happens. Every physics tick, the client sends its own tick number to the server along with its input information. The server receives this input before tick 12 and includes it in the server physics simulation for tick 12. At the end of the server's 12th physics tick, it will send an update to all clients providing the physics update for tick 12. For each client, it also includes the latest client input tick that it received from that client. The client receives the server's update tick which has server tick 12 and client tick 1 in it. Because the client received the update on client tick 5, the client knows that it took 4 ticks for the server to respond to its input. This time is known as the ping, also known as round trip time. The client can divide its ping in half and use that to estimate the tick that the server is currently on. Of course, this isn't perfect. If the client-to-server latency is very different from the server-to-client latency, then our estimation might be wrong. But we can take the average of several half pings and get a pretty stable guess. Now that we have synchronized ticks, we can maintain a buffer of every input the player has performed since the last server tick was received. Then, whenever we receive a new tick, we simply cut off the inputs that have already been processed by the server and replay the remaining inputs on the client. This lets the client effectively predict the player's position as it currently is on the server. Next, I wanted to add some weapons to the game. How they work is pretty simple. When the player clicks, the weapon fires. The weapon firing triggers a cooldown on the player, which prevents them from firing again. Because we've already predicted the player's position, when the player fires his weapon, the spawn projectile's position and velocity can also be predicted by the client. Of course, if the client mispredicts his position, then the projectile might be shot in a slightly wrong direction. In my case, this isn't a big deal. Because damage gets resolved by the server anyways, it'll either result in the player hitting and thinking he should have missed, or the player missing but thinking he should have hit. We can do something similar for enemies and other NPCs. Because we have synchronized ticks, we can move enemies deterministically by having the server say, this monster will move from A to B on ticks 100 to 150. As long as we send that message before the client processes tick 100, then the client can smoothly move the monster along the specified path. Likewise, to have monsters attack, we just have the server send a tick number that the monster attacks on. For now, I just have the monsters attack every n ticks, so if n is 10, then the monsters will attack on tick 100, then tick 110, then tick 120. Finally, I hid the mouse cursor and drew a crosshair sprite at its location every frame to make aiming a little easier. You may have seen the map change in some of the previous clips. I went a bit out of order, but I also made a map editor at some point along the way. You might be wondering why I didn't use something like Tiled or LDTK. While I probably could have squeezed my use case into one of those, I did have a few weird situations like wanting to have infinitely chunked maps and dynamically retiling tiles. I figured it wouldn't be too hard to build my own tools, and it really wasn't. Though I do miss some features like copy paste and undo. To do this, I made multiple layers, each to provide a little more artistic expression to the map. One of the layers is the main layer, which defines the actual tile type that the game uses for physics simulation. 
Behind the main layer, I have two layers for backgrounds, which are usually either walls or water. In front of the main layer, I have two decal layers, which I use to draw things like grass and dirt patches. I also have an entity slot for each tile that I can use to place game entities like trees and collidable walls. Well, that was a lot, but I hope you enjoyed my year of progress. Now that I've caught up to present day, I'm hoping to do these videos more regularly and with more documented recordings. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.